If you look at all the money that people around the world spend on sports, we're talking watching sports, playing sports, buying sports equipment and clothes, gambling on sports, the whole thing. If you add up what's spent on all those tickets to pro games and college events, streaming and cable packages, all those balls, bats, rackets, paddles, sticks, cues, sneakers, caps, jerseys, t-shirts, and those giant foam fingers, it adds up to $2.3 trillion a year. By this estimate, sports is the ninth largest global industry. It's in the same league as things like healthcare and construction. So sports are a huge deal for people all over the world. But what are sports for? Why are we so obsessed with contrived athletic competition? Have humans always been like this? And where is it all heading? Let's explore the past, present, and future of sports. This is one of the earliest images of people playing a sport, in this case, wrestling. It's from around 2000 BC at the Beni Hassan tomb in Egypt. Many early representations of sports are of combat sports, like wrestling, boxing, and archery. It shouldn't be surprising, but sports have always been closely linked to fighting and warfare. At some points in history, it wasn't always easy to tell where sports ended and war began. Around three and a half thousand years ago, people in what is today Mexico and Central America started playing what some historians say was the world's first team sport. It used a rubber ball that, in some cases, weighed as much as a bowling ball. Needless to say, life-threatening injuries were common. In the versions played by the Mayan and Veracruz civilizations, the losing side would sometimes be sacrificed to the gods. The Aztec and Toltec people told stories about kings facing off on the ball courts to vie for the rights to rule each other's territory. Throughout history, military commanders often used sports to help train and condition their soldiers. In the 4th century BC, China's seven major kingdoms were hard at work trying to conquer the other six. When the armies weren't waging war on each other, they developed a military training exercise where two teams each tried to kick a ball into the other team's goal. The ancient Greeks, for their part, saw sporting events as an opportunity to take a break from waging war. Legend has it that the first Olympic Games in 776 BC were held under a truce between kingdoms in the region. For the week leading up to the games and for a week after they ended, all hostilities were banned. They renewed the truce every four years for more than four centuries. That said, there was plenty of bloodshed at the games themselves. Pancration, a combat sport that was a mix of boxing, wrestling, and unmitigated sadism, had just two rules. No biting and no gouging. Everything else was fair game. Except for Sparta. The Spartans were actually okay with the biting and gouging. The result was something that makes MMA look like shuffleboard. The winner was declared only after his opponent died, passed out, or raised his finger in submission. Although sometimes even killing your opponent wouldn't guarantee victory. According to accounts of the Olympic Games in 564 BC, a dead man was declared the winner of a match having used his final breath of air to force his opponent to submit. Maybe you're thinking, okay, this is pretty brutal, but what if we added weapons? Oh, and maybe some lions too. The Romans had the same idea. I'm not sure if there's anybody today who would call gladiatorial combat a sport, but whatever it was, it packed large stadiums, kept concession stands in business, and went on for nearly a thousand years before being officially banned in 325 AD by Emperor Constantine. Since then, sports in general have gradually become less obviously related to combat. Many of the sports that we recognize today can be traced back to early modern England. In addition to soccer, these include games like cricket, which involves hitting a ball with a stick, Field hockey, which involves hitting a ball with a different kind of stick, billiards, which involves poking a ball with a stick, and racket sports, which represent a slight departure from the whole stick thing. Henry VIII, for instance, was an early promoter of tennis. Across the Atlantic, sports were transformed even further. Field hockey was turned into ice hockey, cricket, or possibly a related game, was turned into baseball, and rugby and soccer were combined into something spectacularly dangerous, American football. At least 45 football players died from injuries between 1900 and 1905, with 18 people dying in 1905 alone. Helmets weren't mandatory in the NFL until 1943. Others invented entirely new sports. 
The physical educator James Naismith was an early proponent of football helmets, but he wanted to create a sport that could be played safely indoors. The first basketball game was held in Springfield, Massachusetts in 1891 and resulted in a concussion, a dislocated shoulder, and several black eyes. At the time, it represented a great advancement in player safety compared to football. Naismith inspired his colleague, William Morgan, to invent volleyball. The 20th century saw a proliferation of new sports that blended the rules of existing sports or made use of new technology. These include ultimate frisbee, foot volley, football tennis, underwater hockey, and unicycle hockey, to name a few. The last decades of the 20th century saw the sudden rise of a new kind of recreation, video games. Beginning with video arcades in the 1970s and moving to home consoles in the 1980s. By the end of 2020, people around the world spent more than $300 billion on video games. That's more than the combined revenue of the music and movie industries. Video game tournaments are nearly as old as the games themselves. In 1972, computer scientists at Stanford organized a tournament for one of the first video games, Space War. In 1980, the first ever nationwide Space Invaders competition was held with around 10,000 participants. A year later, gamers went head to head in the surprisingly ruthless inaugural Donkey Kong tournament. In the early 90s, classic fighting games like Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat competitions and tournaments were on the rise. But competitive gaming didn't reach the masses until the last decade of the 20th century. The trend accelerated as more and more gamers became connected to the internet. As internet speeds increased, it was finally possible for players on different continents to compete online in real time. Fast forward to 1998 and the release of the original StarCraft. Considered the best real-time strategy game of all time, StarCraft tournaments have drawn in more than 50 million viewers worldwide. By the time the 2000s rolled around, esports had gained some serious momentum. There's a variety of popular esports tournaments today. The frenetic action of first-person shooter games like Fortnite, Call of Duty, Apex Legends, and Halo, strategy games like League of Legends and Dota 2, fighting games like Mortal Kombat and Super Smash Bros, and of course sports with Madden, NBA 2K, FIFA, and Rocket League leading the way. In fact, the esports industry brought in more than $1 billion in global revenue for the first time last year. Industry analysts expect it to rake in $4.75 billion by 2030. But are esports really sports? In 2014, John Skipper, the president of ESPN, weighed in with a definitive no. It's not a sport, he said. It's a competition. But ESPN changed its tune less than two years later when the network launched a new esports division. Actions speak louder than words, and money usually speaks the loudest, and there is plenty of money to go around. Just ask Booga, the winner of the first ever Fortnite World Cup in 2019. At only 14 years old, he took home a $3 million cash prize. Up until that moment, his parents just thought he was wasting his time. ESPN's esports division closed in 2020, but not without leaving its mark on the network. That's when ESPN began airing live telecasts of esports tournaments. One of these is the NBA 2K Players Tournament, in which NBA players go head-to-head -head on a virtual basketball court. These events were just some of the ways that TV networks had to get creative during the pandemic, when in-person sports events were shut down. The series MLB The Show began airing video game-like simulations of Major League Baseball games that had been postponed. CBS Sportsline developed a sophisticated computer program to run a simulation of a hypothetical NCAA tournament bracket. These simulations generated the same kind of media hype as actual games. That's not the only way that the virtual overlaps with the real world. Sports teams are always on the hunt for innovative and attention-grabbing ways to enhance the viewing experience. Augmented reality, or AR, is essentially a way to add a digital layer to our reality. AR has been an attractive option for innovating the sports industry. It can range from the simple, adding a digital tracker to a fast-moving hockey puck so viewers at home can more easily track its movement, to the advanced, adding a rich, informative layer to the action like track or course information, player performance, and even competitive history. Attending a game in the stadium or arena is an exciting and fun experience. Viewing a game from the comfort of your own home is a rich and informative experience. Augmented reality allows for both experiences to be enhanced, bringing the rich information layer of the at-home viewing experience to the in-stadium experience. 
There's a New York-based startup named DribbleUp that has developed AR-enabled sporting equipment, like a soccer ball with an AR marker printed on the surface that allows users to practice drills. And using a smartphone and augmented reality, the app keeps track of each and every movement of the ball. At the end of each session, the smartphone app assesses each training session and gives you a score to track your progress. Digital technology helps to broaden audiences and participants in traditional sports by making it easier to access, helping to educate, and altogether making sports more fun and entertaining. Just like with sports, military commanders see esports as a potentially valuable simulation and training tool. The connection between the US military and the gaming industry goes way back. Space War was invented in 1962 by a study group in space warfare that was funded by the Pentagon. In the late 1990s, the Marine Corps used a heavily modified version of the first person shooter game, Doom, to train its recruits. Marine Doom, as the game was known, was a precursor to another game that the Pentagon created in house called America's Army. America's Army, a free-to-play tactical shooter, launched in 2002. It proved so immensely popular that by 2008, the game had had a more positive impact on young people than all other army advertising combined. But the military doesn't use gaming technology just for recruitment and training. More and more, video game controls and other interface elements are being integrated right into weapon systems. Xbox controllers, which can connect easily to Windows PC, are sometimes used to control unmanned aircraft and other hardware, such as a periscope on a nuclear submarine or on an experimental anti-drone laser. A new Israeli tank was developed in consultation with teenage gamers. It's controlled by an Xbox controller, and its onboard artificial intelligence was trained on real-time strategy and first-person shooter video games. It seems strangely fitting that since ancient military battles were a crucial element that brought on the birth of competitive sports, that the modern military be such a huge investor into modern competitive esports.